This morning, let's open in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 as we continue our study through Ephesians and as we prepare our hearts for communion, as we'll be partaking together in communion at the end of the study. But let's bow our hearts as we get into the Word. Father, we thank you again for your Word, and we just humble ourselves before you. We ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. May you guide us, Lord, into truth. Like Jesus, you said that if we know the truth, we'll be set free. Amen. And so we want to be set free, Lord, by your truth. So please speak to us, encourage us, uh, exhort us, Lord. Get us to be doing what we know we should be doing and to do it anyway. And uh, we just give you this time and ask you to be blessed, Lord, as we study. And may you bless us in the midst of it, too. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it's this church in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey, and the first three chapters, which we've been kind of rehearsing every time we've been doing the studies, the first three chapters is a lot about what God has already done for us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. If you've become a believer in Christ, He's indwelling you. He's given you the power of His Holy Spirit, and He's caused us positionally to be saints, Before the Lord, if you're a believer in Christ, you're declared righteous. You're already a saint. I know some people feel like, I'm not good, I'm not worthy. Well, the reality is, we're all sinners, but now we've been made saints by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so now, we are to live that way. So as we get into chapter 4 on, chapters 4 and 5, really, is about the walk of the believer. The first three chapters is how you're seated in heavenly places in Christ. Chapters 4 and 5 is about this walk now as a believer. That's why he says in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, because of all that God's done for you, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you were called. And then last week in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we saw how Paul started talking about walking in love. See, now that we have this new life in Christ, we're to walk that way. That, and what's, what do we mean by walking, Christian walk? One step at a time, going forward in the Lord, we're growing, we're walking with Jesus. Mm-hmm. He uses the physical world a lot to bring spiritual realities. So when you're walking somewhere, you're, you have a purpose, you're walking with intention. Well, he tells us to walk in this new life, first of all, walk in love. And set the example. Be, follow God's example, really, is what he said in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, be followers of God as dear children and walk in love. And what does that look like? As Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And then in verse 3, he starts to talk, talk about walking in light, verses 3 through 14, which we looked at last week. And he talks about how you were sometimes darkness. Before Christ, you were evil. (laughs) Let's just call it what it is. I know that's not popular today because everyone thinks, well, everybody's good. They just make bad decisions. Well, we talked about that last week, but that's not true. We're born sinners. Mm -hmm. But now I've given my life to Jesus Christ. Now he's made me from being darkness, and now I'm light. Totally new life. So now walk in light as children, he says. Now as we get into verse 15, verses 15 to 17, which we're going to look at this morning, you could title this Walking in Wisdom. So let's pick up, let's give us a little bit of context. Let's back up to verse um, verse 8. He says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving, testing, you know, uh, showing what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does manifest, Uh, does make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, 
Awake from that, you that sleep and arise from the dead and Christ shall give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. But look at verse 15. Let's break this down. See then, because of that, because now you're children of light, walking in light, see then that you walk circumspectly. There's an old English word we don't use very often nowadays. What does circumspectly mean? Uh, Akribos is the Greek word. It means carefully, accurately, diligently. These are different ways to translate it. So really as Christians... We're to be walking accurately. Well, what's the model? What's the goal? It's to live like Jesus Christ, right? So you can say one thing, but if you're, if you're professing Christ, but you're not walking in Christ, you're not walking accurately, right? It's inaccurate. It's kind of like when people are uh, sharing the gospel. You can talk about Jesus. You can talk about how he saved you from sin, but if you're still walking in sin... It's a contradiction. Right? People aren't going to listen so much to what you say as much as they're going to inspect how you live. And as you live before the Lord, you know, I like the word carefully for this word, circumspectly too, because I think about, have you ever seen those videos of the guys on the tight ropes? Uh, I saw one of a guy walking on a tightrope across Niagara Falls, and I thought, that guy is crazy. No harnesses, nothing, just big old stick and walking across, and you think, this guy's nuts. He better walk carefully, right? He better walk accurately or he's going to be swimming and he'll die, I'm sure. Or I look at these like parkour videos, you know, these guys just jumping around and sometimes on these tall buildings. And I think, well, I would never do that. But that's crazy. You know, they're, if, if they one wrong step and they're done. And there's been young men that have died doing these foolish things, but uh, I guess it's, it's exciting. But walk circumspectly, walk carefully, Paul says. He says, not as fools, not as unwise, not as an unlearned person, but as wise. This word fools, uh, if you want the Rick Green version, you want my translation, don't be dummies is what he's saying. Don't be a fool. Don't be somebody who's unwise, but be smart. Be wise, he says. And Paul's going to go on. He's going to explain what it means to walk in wisdom as you walk circumspectly. What does that mean? How do you do that? Well, first of all, in verse 16, he says, redeeming the time. So in verse 16, if, if you're taking notes, here's your little outline for the study. Verse 16 is redeeming the time. Okay, walking in wisdom circumspectly. Number two, understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's verse 17. And then number three, being continuously filled with the Spirit in verse 18, which we're not going to study this morning, but that's part of the context. So redeeming the time. What does it mean to work caref uh, walk carefully or circumspectly? If you're someone who's going to walk accurately or carefully before the Lord, you need to redeem the time. Redeeming the time or uh, buying it back or rescuing it from loss. In other words, make the most of your time. So much time is wasted. Would you agree with that? We waste a lot of time. And there's so much, there's only so much time that we have on this earth. You know, our days really are numbered. I think about what Job said in Job 14 verses 1 through 5, he says, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He goes on, he says, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with you, you have appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. In other words, God has given us a fixed number of days, each one of us. I think if we were to have the number above our head of how many days we were going to live, maybe how many days we have left, I think some of us would be shocked at what that number would be. You mean I only have one or zero? 
What if today's the day, you know, or 125 or whatever the number would be, but they're all numbered. And actually Psalm 39, 4, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Psalm 90, verse 10, Moses wrote this. He said, the days of our years are 70, and if by reason of strength they be 80 years, Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And then in verse 12, he says, So teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Basically, you have 70 or 80 years. I mean, if you live to 100, you get past 80, you're doing really, really well. Like, but really, 70, 80, that's been about the life expectancy of man. So let's say you live to be 100 years old. Max, maybe 105. You know, some people, some people get that far. That's really not that long in the grand scheme of things. You think about eternity? How long is eternity? Jesus, well, the Apostle Peter actually speaking about the Lord. He says that to the Lord a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years like a day. I mean, eternity is just going to go on thousands and thousands and thousands of years and it's just going to keep going on. But what's that compared to my 100? I mean, think about it. If you go back to Adam, and he was about 6,000 years ago, and say you live to be 100, that's, as far as human history, that's a little piece of the pie, isn't it? And yet, it's so brief. Proverbs 27.1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring. You know, Jesus told a parable of the guy, he was a rich man, had a lot of goods, he had all these barns, and he's like, man, I filled up all these barns, like, I got so much stuff, I'm going to have to, like, build bigger barns so I can fill it up with more stuff. But then, he, in this parable, he says, but God said to the man, you fool, tonight your soul is going to be required of you. The guy didn't realize that he only had a certain amount of time. And yet he was partying, he was having fun and doing all this stuff. But Jesus warned against that. James said, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Our life is so short. You know, it's, it's not like the guy who said, God put me on earth to do so many things and I'm so far behind that I'm never going to die, right? You're going to end up dying with a lot to get done. That's usually how it goes. But we need to redeem the time. God has fixed to us a certain amount of time. We need to use as much of that time for him more than even for ourselves. And I think there are many things to, that we do today that are just a waste of time. They have no eternal value. And I'm not saying that we can't go on vacations and have fun. Those things can have eternal value if we're doing them as under the Lord. You know, if you're spending time with your family, that can be a, an act of worship to the Lord. You're putting, you're making little disciples, you know, and our kids and stuff like that. But so many hours are wasted either watching TV or going through reels on, I mean, I'll just lose time. I'm going through reels and all of a sudden I've wasted an hour. Just entertain, entertainment, right? I got nothing to do. Just, you know, that was funny. Yeah, that one's stupid. And we just waste so much time. So I'm not condemning anybody. I'm saying we all get convicted by this. But like, you know, here it is Sunday morning. Football starts next week, right? I must say I'm very thankful for the NFL Plus uh, subscription that I can get because an NFL game is like three hours when you include all the commercials and everything, and that's a lot of time. And I usually can't watch. I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. I know. Pray for me. But people are like, why are you not a Charger fan? Well, anyway, I grew up with Dan Marino. I, I love Dan Marino. But anyway, uh, I love that app because, you know, I can't watch the game anyway. I'm, the games are usually at 10 a.m. Church starts at 10, so I, I miss the game. Maybe I should put it right here on my little phone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, uh, but I, I look at the score after church, and I go, oh, they won. Cool, I'll watch it later. But I can watch it without all the commercials, and I can skip through stuff. So I can watch the game in about an hour and a half. 
And if they lose, I'm like, well, I'm not going to watch that. That's a waste of time, three hours. So maybe I'll watch the, like, the two-minute highlights just to see what happened. But we can waste so much time, you know? And so many wasted hours on, you know, video games. And I'm speaking of grown men who should be working and that they're playing video games. But how many, think about it for you, for this week, just for example, how many important things did you not do this week because of a lack of time? We all have stuff that I wish I would have got that done. I wish I had more time or I wish I would have budgeted my time better, right? There's an old poem by C.T. Studd, and I had asked Mike that we could put it on the screen. Um, it's called Only One Life will soon be passed. That's the name of it. So what I was thinking is I'll share, I'll read the stanzas or the verses, but I'm going to have you guys repeat out loud with me. I love, it says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That is the stanza. And I want us to repeat that because I want this to get into our heart. I've heard this many times throughout the years and it just sticks with me as a good reminder. So he starts off this poem, two little lines I heard one day. Traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. And then all together, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. He, he goes on, only one life, yes, only one, soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its days I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We're almost done. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world, now let me turn. Living for thee and thee alone. Bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, t'was worth it all. Only one life, t'will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And then there's one little extra stanza. Only one life, t'will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. Isn't that great? I know it's long, but it's just such a blessing. I, I was like, I got to share that. When you're talking about redeeming the time, it's so true. You only have one life. My wife and I go for walks, and we, sometimes we'll go walk through the Oak Hill Cemetery over here. And you see all these numbers, people's years that they've survived, you know, the 1880 to 1936 or whatever. And you think, that is one life. They didn't have any more, and they didn't have any less. And you've probably heard it before, but that little dash in between, that's our life. What are you doing with it? Are you using it for Christ? Or are you doing, using it for yourself? Here's a cross-reference if you're taking notes. Colossians 4, 5. He says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, or on the outside, redeeming the time. Walk in wisdom. Buy back. Make the most of your time. And I believe that one of the best ways that to live is to live with an urgency to get the gospel out. 
There's a lot of people that are perishing. I mean, here we're in a world of 8 billion plus people. Most of them are lost and going to hell. And you and I as Christians are the, really the only hope for them because we have the message of the gospel that can get them saved. You say, Rick, that's a lot of pressure to put on us. Well, that's what the commandment the Lord's given us. And he rose from the dead, and he's given us a great commission to go out and make disciples of all the nations. So we don't want to waste time because I only have one life. If I knew the Lord was going to come back today, what would I do different? Nothing. I wouldn't do anything different. I'd just keep living for the Lord. You know? Uh, so that's the question. What are you living your life for? Jesus had this urgency. John chapter 9, verse 4, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work, he said. John 12, 35, he said, Jesus said to them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness knows not where he's going. Paul had this urgency. Romans chapter 13, he says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. And he said that the fashion of this world is passing away. You see, people are living for this world, and they think, well, I want to build up my career. I want to go on all these vacations and have this huge house. And they have all their ambitions. But at the end of the day, it's all going to perish. You can't take it with you. Right? You probably heard Greg Laurie say many times, you can't take a U-Haul behind a hearse. You know, because you can't take it with you. It's all going to perish. But the time is short. And so how can we practically redeem the time? And we're talking about redeeming it, walking circumspectly. How do we practically do that? And I thought of a few things. Uh, maybe they'll encourage you. Maybe it'll spur you on to do these kind of things. But I'd say, number one, pray for people around you. Let's say you're at the store and you're waiting in line. Don't you hate waiting in line? You're waiting even for the self-checkout. Sometimes there's a long line. Well, just start praying for the people in front of you and behind you. Lord, please open a door maybe to share the gospel with them. I don't know what they're going through. Lord, maybe they just need strength today. Can you help them and point them to you? Uh, you might even work in a cubicle next to other people and maybe praying for them. You know, the, the amazing thing about prayer is it really is entering into that spiritual battle. And I kind of liken it to, like, say you have an, a co-worker who's not a believer. You could be dropping bombs, spiritual bombs on them all day long, Amen. right, against the enemy. You could start praying for missionaries across the world. Prayer is so powerful. But let's redeem the time. Instead of just like, oh, that stupid co-worker's doing all this stuff to annoy me, well, maybe pray for them. Redeem that time. Um, I just think about the impact that we could have as the church if we gave time to prayer that we do to our phones. If we spent the same amount of time praying as we did scrolling on reels, I think we could make a huge impact. Number two, another practical way is listen to Bible studies while you're driving. You can even pray while you're driving. Just make sure you keep your eyes open while you're driving, you know. <laughs> but listening to Bible, one of the things that I love to do, um, you know, I work uh, in, at Palomar College full time. And Tuesdays, I end up doing all the, I go to the other sites, you know, Escondido, Rancho Bernardo, and uh, Fallbrook. And so I drive to all these places. Well, I'll turn on. Bible studies and listen to them while I'm driving to these areas. Why waste the time? I mean, I'm on the clock. You know, might as well use it. And usually I'll listen to a couple of sermons on what I'm teaching that week, which is kind of cool. It's kind of the double 
uh, what do you call that, killing two birds with one stone kind of thing, because I, I need to study, but I also, you know, want to listen to Bible study, so I'll do that as well. Um, but even sometimes, you know, doing the dishes, loading the dishwasher, uh, put on some headphones and listen to some worship music and worship the Lord while I'm doing it or listen to a Bible study. Otherwise, it's just dead time, you know. But the third thing, sharing the gospel with other people. I mean, you know, I think about going to my kids' games, uh, football games and stuff like that. And usually you're sitting around all these other parents cheering on, and you kind of get to know them. Well, maybe the Lord will open a door to share with them. You know, it's halftime, nothing going on. Go use the bathroom, get your nachos or whatever, and then maybe share the gospel with somebody. But you see what I mean? There's practical ways you can fit time in and make time to invest in spiritual things. It's not a legalistic thing. It doesn't mean you can't veg out sometimes, but you got to ask the Lord, Lord, is this something that you want me to do to rest, or am I re redeeming the time, or what am I doing? And he tells us why here in Ephesians 5, verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The days are evil. We don't even need to talk too much about that. But we're living in evil times. And the Bible told us about these days in which we live. 2 Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days, perilous, dangerous times shall come. Paul said that evil men will wax worse and worse. And we're seeing it, aren't we? Right? I mean, here in the United States, we're living in an evil society. We have drag queens reading stories to our children in libraries. Our children can get gender-affirming care, which includes puberty, puberty blockers and sex changes for minors. Abortions considered reproductive rights for a woman, yet there's another human being inside of her, and you know that's not her body, as they say. Many of the children who are brought into our country illegally are placed in homes of traffickers. And when the social workers come to claim the kid, oh, you didn't give us a kid. Well, no, we did. And there's this whole process These, that children are getting lost in the system and they end up getting trafficked. That's happening here in San Diego. Marriages of same-sex couples are accepted and encouraged. And if you're a Christian and disagree and speak out against this perversion. You're a homophobe and a bigot, right? That's what they say. I was invited this week to uh, a meeting with the chief of police with some other pastors and you know, leaders in the community. And uh, they were talking about the violence that's happening here in Escondido and the crisis that is happening with the fentanyl overdoses and, you know, you... <laughs> The poor police officers get so much flack from the community. There's so much evil, you know, hate towards them. I see it on, you know, Escondido Friends and some of these Facebook groups and stuff. But um, they're really trying to help our community. And so one of the things they're doing, they, they brought us together. to. They want pastors and ministers to come in so that we could be there when there's a crisis, an immediate crisis, to help minister to people. They're like, you and your church can be a... a place that you know for our community where you can bring and share hope and share some encouragement and and there's not a lot of police departments that do that we're actually a pretty rare here in Escondido a rare police department and wanting to do that I I believe that our chief of police is a Christian and uh, which is a huge blessing and he's brought in some other guys that are Christians and so we have a great opportunity to minister to our city um but anyway, that just shows me, though, that how evil our society is. We live in days that are evil. Um, but that also means that the Lord's coming back soon. Because if the days are getting worse and worse, at some point, God's got to pour out his wrath on this world because he's holy and he's just. But Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What were the days of Noah like? Well, there was a population explosion in Genesis 6. It was a time of violence, right? People getting hurt. That's the days in which we live. 
But Jesus also says, also as it was in the days of Lot, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. What were the days of Lot like? Well, there was a huge push by the homosexual community, not just wanting to do what they want to do, but aggressively pushing it on society. That's happening today. So I look at these things and it excites me because that means Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> but because we're children of light, we need to walk circumspectly. And one of the ways of doing that is redeeming the time. Amen. Don't be involved with dumb things. Walk in wisdom. Walk in eternal things, eternal value. He says here, verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise. Now that word unwise, you could translate that as mindless, without reason, or the Rick Green version, stupid. <laughs> Don't be stupid. Right? Use your brain. Think about this. Think about it. He says, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Put it together mentally is this idea, this word understanding, or to gain insight. Consider it. Think about it. Don't be like somebody who's unwise and just mindlessly just go about your life and go about your business. No. Have eternal perspectives. Right? Don't be dumb. Be smart. How are you going to be smart? By doing things and putting yourself in understanding, putting it all together mentally so you can know what the will of the Lord is. One of the questions that I get as a pastor, and most pastors get this question, is how can I know God's will for my life? Maybe you have that question. It's a great question to ask. How do I know God's will for my life? How do I know what God wants me to do? Do you realize he wants you to understand what the will of the Lord is? That's what he says right here, understanding what the will of the Lord is. I want my life to precisely follow God's plan and purpose. How about you? It is not wise to leave God out of your planning. We make plans as families, as, you know, as a church. We make plans as people. You know, you plan out your week. You, I got to go to work this day. Tuesday, I got to do this. Wednesday night, I got to do this. And we make our plans but let me ask you, is God ever considered in your plans? This is something the Lord is always reminding me and teaching me. Did you pray about that? Or are you just making that decision? Because there's a lot of good things in life to do, but what does the Lord want me to do? Like, do you know where you're supposed to go? Do you know when you're supposed to go? Do you have all the facts about what's ahead? No clue, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you know where your path will take you? Not necessarily. So we need to seek the Lord about these things, right? So you want to ask the Lord about everything and understand His will. And the reason we want to know and understand what His will is is so that as we walk in it, we're walking in fullness, why are there a lot of even Christians walking around just so discouraged and so down and just bored and just existing? It's probably because they're not walking in all that God has for them. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you feel like you're just existing. I want to encourage you, understand what the will of the Lord is. Find out what God has for you and then live it. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. And he said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He says that if you come and you believe in him, that out of your innermost being will gush torrents of living water. So if you're not experiencing that, let me suggest to you that God has more for you. So how do we understand what the will of the Lord is? Because that's the question. Okay, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Thanks, Paul. What is it? How do I find out? How do I understand it? Okay, I got two points on this one if you're taking notes. Number one, we do know the general will of God for our lives. You know how we know that? It's recorded in Scripture. 
We know what God wants for our lives. Uh, it's God's will that you walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Right? Ephesians 4.1. In Ephesians 4, verses 12 through 16, it's God's will that you mature as a believer and fulfill your ministry in the body. Chapter 4, verses 17 through 32, it's God's will that you not walk as the world. We know that. It's God's will that you walk in love. We know that. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 through 14 of chapter 5, we know it's God's will that we walk as children of light. Right? Even in our text this morning, verse 15, we know that God wants us to work circumspectly, carefully. And in verse 16, he, it's his will that you redeem the time. You know, there's actually a few scriptures in the New Testament that specifically speak of God's will. What's God's will? What is God's will? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So... If you're not married, don't sleep around. That's, that's God's will, that you don't do that. But even, he says, your sanctification. What's sanctification? There's a big theological word for us this morning. Sunday morning, right before we eat, right? It means your daily walk with the Lord and you're being changed daily. Amen. Moment by moment, you're being sanctified. You're being set apart. You're, you're more and more becoming set apart for the Lord. That's God's will for you. Is that happening? Or are you at a stalemate where you're not growing? You say, well, I want to know God's will for my life. Well, first of all, do the general will. Are you being sanctified? Are you, is there sanctification happening in your life? 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Are you doing that? Giving thanks to the Lord? In everything. He doesn't necessarily say for everything. He says in everything. So you might be going through trials. You, well, Lord, I'm thanking you in it. <laughs> I don't understand where it's going yet, but I know you're good. And I thank you, Lord, for who you are. Amen. So these are things that talk about God's will for us in a general sense. We do know God's general will as believers. So then that comes to the specific will for each of us individually. Did you know that you can discover God's specific will for your life? God has a specific plan and purpose for you. And he's had it all planned out. You say, but I don't know what it is. That's okay. That's part of the fun of being a Christian is discovering what God has for my life. That's what the Christian life is. It's a, it's a life of discovery. I'm, I'm trying to just follow the Lord and see him where he takes it. It's a little scary sometimes. Oh, but it's so fun. It's so encouraging. It's so exciting to be a Christian. People will tell you, oh, you become a Christian. Now you can't have any fun. And I'm like, that is dumb. It is so fun. It's hard. There's trials. But I love being a Christian. It's way better than when I wasn't a Christian. You know, last Monday night we were talking about suffering, and we're like, you're going to suffer in the world either way. First Peter, you're going to suffer either way. You might as well suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing, <laughs> right? But we can discover God's will for our lives, and here's a couple of practical things for that. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Turn left a couple of books. How do I discover God's specific will for my life? Well, first, do the general things, right? The things recorded in Scripture. Become more like Jesus. Love your neighbors, you know, all the basic things. We know, I say we almost have enough to know in God's general will that we need to fulfill before we even worry about the specific things. <laughs> Would you agree with that? But you can Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye, that ye may prove, right, you may know what is the good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how are you going to discover it? Well, he says here, present your body a living sacrifice. Lord, my body's yours. Right? A living sacrifice. You get an animal, normally you put it on, they'd put it on the altar and then they'd sacrifice it. Well, the problem with a living sacrifice is you want to jump off the altar sometimes. But Lord, I submit my life to you. Fully submitted. Holy, separate, acceptable to God. And then he says, don't be conformed to this world. I like the J.B. Phillips in this translation. He says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. He says, but be transformed by how? The renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind as a Christian? The Word of God. As you get into the Word, it transforms and renews your mind. Right? You start to think more rightly because you're thinking biblically. So how am I going to discover God's will? you got to be in the Scriptures. you got to be in the Word. you got to be submitted to it. If it tells you you're wrong about something, i got to repent and change that thing. Amen. See, I can't come to the Bible with my preconceived notion, well, the Bible contradicts what I think. Well, the Bible's wrong. No, I'm wrong, and I need to correct my thinking to the Bible. So that's the first step of discovering God's will is lining it up with Scripture. Secondly... I'd say praying and seeking the Lord about it. And I'd say about specific things. Lord, do you want me to do A or B? Or is there a C or D or is there something else you want to show me? Right? Ask the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is one of the, my favorite verses in discovering the will of God for my life. I remember asking my pastor, uh, Dave Shirley, when... Uh, Liesl and I were getting engaged, and I, you know, I wanted to make sure I married the right one. Right? I had a guy tell me, he goes, a, a woman will either make you or break you, especially in the ministry. And I was like, okay, I want to have the right one. Dave, how do I know she's the right one? I mean, she's got all these great characteristics. Uh, she's, she's, you know, lovely person. I just, everything about her I'm, I'm into. I love her, but how do I know? I don't want to make a mistake. And he told me, he said, the most theologically correct view of God's will is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. And he even told me in the Hebrew, it means he's going to lay out the path in front of you as you're walking. But how do you, how do you find out? How do you know where the road's going to go? You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You don't lean on your own understanding. I don't have it all figured out. But the part that we normally miss is, you know, in all your ways, acknowledge him. That means pray about it. Acknowledge the Lord in these things. That's usually the one where I mess up. I, oh, trust in the Lord, and it looks great to me, you know. But, oh, Lord, what do you have? So praying about everything and trusting the Lord. And then thirdly, I think in, uh, the way to discover God's specific will for your life, understanding what the will of the Lord is, is through the leading of the Holy Spirit. And there's a, a few different ways I see this in Scripture. Uh, Hebrews 8, 8 through 13 talks about this new covenant that God has made with us, which actually we're going to celebrate with communion, but how we don't relate to God anymore based on rules and laws like the children of Israel. We relate based on grace. And part of this new covenant that God made is he takes out our stony heart and he gives us a new heart, a heart of flesh. And he puts his spirit within us. So now we have the Holy Spirit. And he says that he will put his law on our hearts. So that, that means there are times there's desires in your heart that are from God. Of course, there's the other side. Sometimes there's desires in there that are not from God because we still have our sinful flesh. It says don't trust your heart, right? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? It's desperately wicked. Jeremiah, I uh, forget the reference, but it's in the book of Jeremiah. But sometimes he does put desires in our hearts. But how do I know if it's the Holy Spirit or if it's me or if it's the devil tempting me? 
right? Because you got all these voices, right, coming around. How do I know? Well, if it's the Holy Spirit, generally, it'll just line up with Scripture. Amen. If it's me, it could line up with Scripture. But if it doesn't work out the right way, well, that wasn't the Lord, then that was me, right? If it contradicts Scripture, it's most likely the enemy. Of course, that could be me too, because I have a sinful flesh. Psalm 37, 4, the psalmist says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I believe God places desires in our heart. But also the leading of the Holy Spirit, sometimes he gives a word of prophecy. He'll speak through a brother or sister a word specifically for you. Now, if they come and they say, God told me that you're going to get in a car accident after church today, I can tell you that's not the Holy Spirit. You know how I know that? Because 1 Corinthians 14 says that the gift of prophecy, if it's a prophecy of the Lord, it's for edification, exhortation, or comfort. Well, that doesn't really edify me to tell me I'm going to crash my car after church. That doesn't really exhort me to want to do anything good, and it doesn't comfort me. So that's not the Lord. But then there are times when someone will speak to you, because I... For example, coming to start the church in Escondido, I was in that place of, Lord, is this what you want to do? Because I don't want to just do it if it's not you. A friend of mine, Holland Davis, started talking to me, and he didn't even know. It wasn't like a, thus saith the Lord kind of thing. He's just like, man, you need to do it. You need to just jump in, just do it. And I really felt like, because the Lord was already speaking that to me, then it came from his mouth. And it just spoke to me. I'm like, okay, Lord, you're directing me. Yeah. And now I look back. It's been three years. And look, obviously the Lord did speak. So that's exciting. And sometimes with these words of prophecy, it's interesting. Because Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me saying, uh, When so-and-so comes, buy their field. And it'll, you know, when this happens, talk to your uncle and buy the field. He goes, and then my... Uncle came and said such and such. He says, and then I knew it was the word of the Lord. See, he wasn't quite sure, but he's like, the word of the Lord came to me. But when it was confirmed, that was the word of the Lord. Now, I think you need to be careful sometimes. You know, we're not Jeremiah. You want to be careful not to always say, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, because maybe he didn't. <laughs> Uh, my wife's very careful about that. She's like, I'm not going to say the Lord told me unless I'm sure the Lord told me because I don't want to misquote him or misrepresent him. So, um, But in the book of Acts, you know, they were ministering to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. So he can lead you through prophecy. Most of the time for me, he leads through open doors and closed doors, through circumstances. Sometimes the Lord leads us through circumstances. Like in Acts 16, you remember the Apostle Paul wanted to take the gospel to Asia Minor in Turkey, but it says the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. Then he wanted to go to Bithynia, but then the Holy Spirit didn't let him. It doesn't tell us how he forbid him to go, but somehow circumstantially they're like, we're not supposed to do this whether he was sick or maybe there was a word of prophecy, I don't know. But then they went down to Troas and Paul had this vision of this man in Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. And Luke writing, he says, we concluded that the Lord was speaking to Paul. So it wasn't like there was this huge, you know, glow and thus saith the Lord. They're like, you know, we're putting it all together and it's, the Lord's leading us this way. That's how the Lord directs us. We understand his will as we trust him, not lean on our own understanding, acknowledge him, and he will straighten out that path in front of us. That's so exciting. Our part is to discover it by how? By redeeming the time, walking circumspectly, and not being unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. See, we're living in days where we need more than ever to walk carefully as Christians. The enemy is trying to, to discredit your witness, and sometimes we do that. We'll say something dumb on the job, and, oh, they know I'm a Christian, and I shouldn't have joked like that. 
But you know what? You just got to go forward. Just, Lord, this is, I know I've been dumb. I know I've been doing this stuff. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to redeem the time. I want to walk in everything you have for me. And that's part of what communion is. We're going to celebrate communion this morning. It's a memorial time. It's a time when we remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. You know, you look at Jesus' life. How many years was it before he started his ministry? 30 years. And what did he do during that time? He worked a job. He was a carpenter. Yeah, he went to school. He, He did the normal things that we do. Sometimes you might feel like your life's so mundane, but some of those things could be the very place God has you and he just wants you to be faithful and the thing with Jesus is he didn't waste time we think well he wasn't preaching yet he wasn't doing miracles yet because that didn't start till his baptism but he redeemed the time he even said when he was 12 years old in the temple they're like where were you we were looking all, all over for you and he says shouldn't I be about my father's business even as a young boy he knew he was living for his father How much more for us? We could be doing the mundane things, but still redeeming the time. As if we're doing them as unto the Lord. Right? The the difference between Jesus and us is that we're sinful. He's perfect. And yet he submitted himself to his parents. He worked a job. He did all those things that we do. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he had his calling that he had to walk in, and he walked in it. Once you have the Holy Spirit and you know what God's doing in your life, you need to walk in it. Don't waste time. So I encourage you this morning, if you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, do that. But if you haven't even given your life to the Lord, today's the day to start. There's nothing more exciting than being a Christian. You'll have trials just like everybody else. Sometimes it gets harder because now you have an enemy who's against you. But if you follow Jesus, the eternal value is going to far outweigh this temporary pleasure. And so we have an open communion. If you're a believer in Jesus, we're going to have you partake with us. Uh, They're they're going to come and pass out the bread and the cup. Just hold on to them. Um, If you're not a believer, we'd ask that you just let it pass. Uh, It's for believers. But... If you're not a believer and you want to be a believer, it's really simple. And we'll get into communion this way. If you want to give your life to the Lord or rededicate your life to the Lord, it's, here's the gospel message that's really simple. It's so simple a child can understand it. We're sinners, right? We've all violated God's law. We've all sinned. We've all done wrong things. We've all violated our own conscience even. But that's why God came as a man in the person of Jesus Christ and died on the cross for our sins. He paid the penalty so that we don't have to go to hell. That's the gospel. He died on the cross, paid for all of our sins, and he was buried. The third day he rose again, and he says, if you'll just believe in me and what I did for you, I'll give you my righteousness and eternal life, and you give me your sin. It'll be an even exchange, and you don't have to worry about your sin anymore, and you'll go to heaven to be with the Lord when you die. That's the gospel message. So if you want to receive Christ, or if you want to rededicate your life to him this morning as we partake of communion, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if that's you, just in your own heart before the Lord, he hears you. Just pray something like this. Say, dear Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of everything I've done wrong. I know I don't deserve to go to heaven And I can't earn it by my own works. But I believe that you died on the cross for me, for my sin. And that you were buried. And I believe that you rose again the third day. And right now, I receive the gift of eternal life. And for those of you that want to rededicate your life, say, Dear Lord, I know I haven't been walking as I should. And I thank you that you don't condemn me. But I do turn to you, Lord, I repent. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit and that as I walk forward from this day forward, Lord, help me to redeem the time 
especially knowing these days are evil. We look to you, Lord. We want to remember you today as we partake of the elements at, the, at your table together. In Jesus' name, amen.